good afternoon and welcome to our series Diplomacy, Your Question, Our Answers. Uh, this afternoon, we are talking about uh, Myanmar for obvious reasons. Uh, and the title of this hour of discussion is Coup d'etat in Myanmar, a country taken hostage again. And I guess the again is an important part of the discussion of this hour. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, a young but very uh, intensive expert on the situation in Myanmar, Mr. Georg Bauer. Welcome to our, to our meeting. Mr. Bauer is, is uh, at, working at the History Department, University of Vienna, but he spent uh, about two years recently uh, in Myanmar uh, in various capacities. And welcome also to our moderator, Susanne Wittner. Uh, she is a student at the Diplomatic Academy uh, in our Master of Advanced uh, International Studies program. Um, by way of introduction, I would only like to say, and it's quite unfortunate that we have uh, to have such a discussion uh, about the again of military rule in a country like Myanmar. Uh, but um, I understand that the, the background and reasons for this uh, partly internal reasons of problems in state and nation building uh, in Myanmar, in this region, Asian region, and partly certainly also it has to do with the international community and how we react or don't react and how we may react on what's going on in a country like Myanmar. Uh, it's, uh, it's very well known where we start from. It's about a week ago. Uh, the military um, uh, declared a state of emergency for one year, as far as I understand, for the time being, uh, and the uh, put into uh, under house arrest um, uh, Okso Ox Yung Ki in, and also the president of Myanmar and partly also members of the parliament uh, in Myanmar uh, for the time being. There are protests in the streets. Uh, and there is already some sort of, uh, of uh, um, I would also say, more violent response by the military side on what's going on in Myanmar itself. The international response uh, has been uh, divided. Uh, and the best proof for this is uh, the Security Council of the United Nations, where there was no common resolution because of uh, the um, the position of uh, China and Russia and some analysts say this has certainly also to do that these two countries are the biggest suppliers uh, of uh, of military or so of weapons and military equipment uh, to the regime in in, in Myanmar uh, and uh, regarding regional organizations uh, when we talk about ASEAN ASEAN has not yet really responded to the crisis. And I guess they will do in the future. Uh, the only international sort of international cooperation that res uh, responded unanimously was the G7 um, minister, foreign ministers meeting, where there was a condemnation of the of the coup d'état and the ongoing violence uh, at the moment in in, in Myanmar. Uh, so there's a lot on the on the plate, and I'm much looking forward uh, to our discussion. Uh, and I pass on to Susanne Wittner. Thank you, um, Ambassador Dr. Briggs. Um, I would like to welcome again um, Mr. Georg Bauer, who is currently doing his PhD at the University of Vienna and teaching a class on conflict and state building in the Union of Burma. Furthermore, he has worked at the Australian Embassy in Myanmar in Yangon and also at the delegation of the European Union to Myanmar. Welcome, Mr. Georg Bauer. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity, although, as we already said, the reason is not a, a happy one. Um, I will share my PowerPoint presentation, and I want to thank everyone who is interested in the topic. Um, it is important for the people <clears throat> in the country that they receive attention and that it does not get um, swamped away in the news by all the pandemic and all other news that are currently occupy occupying the world. Um, just briefly, but that has already um, been mentioned. Um, I am now a PhD student at the University of Vienna, um, but used to live and work in Myanmar in the human rights field, working first for the European Union delegation and then for the Australian embassy. Um, quick overview 
of uh, the content and structure of, of, uh, of my talk. Um, I'll give a quick overview of the hard facts of what happened since February 1st. Um, I will go back, especially being a historian, I think it's important to look at the history of, of who's a military rule. So I'll have a quick overview of the uh, past 70 years. I will talk about the Tamadon as the Myanmar armed forces are known in the country, uh, as well as about the 2008 constitution that they drafted and which is still in force now. <clears throat> and then I will offer some thoughts of what could possibly have led to the coup. Then we will go to see how the people in the country have reacted, what could happen next, and what could possibly be done from the outside. And in the end, there will be options to ask questions and add comments and thoughts. So what happened? Very briefly, in the early morning hours, and sorry, before I start, I want to just mention that uh, for a week now, I've been doing nothing else than, than trying to help, uh, yeah, to, to talk to journalists and write articles and prepare talks. And, and um, so I would hope that you forgive me if I have in all the rush uh, forgive, uh, forgotten one or the other detail in this talk. But briefly about um, the facts, hard facts of what happened on the 1st of February in the early morning hours, um, President Uwe Mint, as well as State Council Dong, San Suu Kyi, and many other government officials, um, as well as members elect of the new parliament, but also activists, monks, and civil society organization members were detained. Um, this happened on the day that was supposed to be the first day, first convent, convening of the new parliament that was elected in November last year. Uh, the milit what the military did was um, after they had arrested President Win Mint, um, the vice president, which is by the constitution a nominee of the military, uh, declared a state of emergency under the constitution and transferred all power to commander in chief of the Myanmar Armed Forces, again, as they're known Tatmadaw, to senior general Minang Lang, also known as Ma'ala. Um, and the, this state of emergency is to last uh, one year. And uh, so far, they have promised to hold election, elections within this year. The constitution allows for the extension of the state of emergency twice for half a year. The justification of the military was um, their alleged voter fraud, um, which thus they claimed because the election was fraudulent, the new government would have been a usurping one. Uh, threatening the sovereignty of the country from within, and thus they had they needed to take over power. They dissolved the Union Election Commission, um, which uh, was responsible for the last elections, and formed a new one, and already promised that they would investigate um, the last elections, and this new election commission would hold the new elections. They also formed a new cabinet, or rather a council known as the State Administrative Council, which has taken over from the previous government. Um, and since then, protests have started and have grown in intensity. I will go into the details of the legality of the state of emergency uh, a bit later. But first, a quick overview of, um, of coups and military rule in a country that has unfortunately seen much of this already. Um, the country achieved its independence in 1948 and uh, was before that, uh, for about 120 years, uh, colony of the, of the British. And within one year, uh, civil war starts. Um, this we could talk about uh, for hours again, but very briefly put, um, promises and agreements between different ethnic groups in the country were not held um, by the central government. And so several started their uprisings right away and others joined later. Um, so the 50s, um, were a very unstable situation. The country was severely destroyed by World War II. Uh, it saw the uprising of several ethnic groups. It saw a communist uprising. It saw invasions of uh, Chinese national forces of Chiang Kai-shek in the northeast of the country. But for the first years, parliamentary democracy at least prevailed. Um, in 1958, though, there was the first, what we can say, quasi-coup. It depends on how you view it. Um, officially, the then Prime Minister Unu invited the commander in chief of the armed forces, Ne Win, to take over the government for two years as a so called caretaker government. And these two years um, were the first 
of total uh, military rule in the country since independence. And in these two years, Ne Win installed experts and technocrats into the uh, ministries, and he sort of brought some sort of stabilization to the country. Um, and as promised in 1960, he relinquished power again and elections were held. So we see a brief return to parliamentary democracy. But apparently in these two years, Ne Win got a taste of power. And so in 1962, he stages a second coup. This time, uh, there was no obvious invitation. The, the reason for that was that Prime Minister Unu was going to um, negotiate with leaders of the other ethnic groups in the country to reform the country into a federal uh, structure as it had been agreed uh, in 1947. And that is not, uh, uh, so for Nguyen and the, and the military, uh, this was unacceptable and they did not want to see a federalization of the country. So they t do a full takeover, they arrest UNU, Prime Minister UNU and, and other leaders in the country and establish full military rule and abolish the constitution. Um, and until 1974, there is no proper constitution in the country. Um, this, and then uh, Ne Win establishes what he called the Burmese way to socialism. And there is the Burmese Socialist Program Party, but it's, it is essentially ruled uh, by military and by, by generals. So it is a, is a in de facto uh, military rule. And this uh, Burmese way to socialism and this junta completely destroys the economy of the country. Uh, people become even poorer than before. Uh, there are brutal oppressions of, of the different ethnic groups in the country. Um, until in 1988, we see a massive uprising um, starting in Yangon. Uh, and Dong Aung San Suu Kyi, who, um, who is the most well-known Burmese uh, person, I guess, um, takes leadership. She is in the country by chance. She used to live in England and she just returned to the country to take care of her mother. And she is the daughter of uh, General Aung San, who was the founder of the army um, and is sort of the independence hero. The, he has legendary st status in the country and he, was, he had been assassinated in 1947. Um, so she takes the leadership role in the protests um, but the, the protests are brutally suppressed, but um, Ne Win steps down. Um, and um, after a while, um, a military coup happens. Now, again, it's a bit weird. As I said, it was actually more or less military rule, but again, it's generals who sort of take over control, abolish the constitution um, and form what they first call the State Law and Order Restoration Council, SLORC. And, but first, they actually hold elections in the 1990s, in 1990, which the National League for Democracy, which is the party of Aung San Suu Kyi, wins by a landslide. Um, this is one of the, of the big examples in history that shows how delusional um, the military is in its perception of reality that they actually expected to win these elections. Um, and when they are faced with the reality that people want someone else to be in power, they actually just ignore the elections and establish a dictatorship under uh, General Tan Shui, who becomes the dictator and would last until 2010. But um, the, in economic terms, of course, the Burmese way to socialism is abandoned in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, sort of, it's hard to put a name to it, but I would say it's a crony market economy. Um, where basically the families um, of military generals and the, and the military itself um, make a lot of money extracting resources and, and basically forming businesses and, and having a bit more of a, I don't want to say open market because it's only for them, um, but they get rich, whereas the, the vast majority of the people still stay very, very poor. They also start drafting of a new con constitution and present the roadmap to discipline flourishing democracy in their poetic words. Briefly about the techno, because they are such an important actor in all of this, obviously. Um, I want to say in the beginning that there are very few people who have proper insight into, into this institution. They are basically a state in a state and it's, it's hard to gain insight into that and the people are very hard to predict. So also what I say here about their potential motivations for the recent coup 
um, are just speculations. And I reiterate that people should remember that and there were other people who will have a different view of that. And this is also one of the problems because we understand them very badly and they seem very irrational to us uh, because we, it's very hard to grasp their, their thinking. Um, they were formed in the 1940s when Aung San Suu Kyi's father Aung San and the 30 comrades, including uh, the future dictator Nguyen, Win, um, traveled to Japan uh, to receive military training. And uh, when they return, they fight on the, on the, during World War II on the Japanese side and help Japan occupy uh, Burma. And, um, but then in the end of the war, they switch sides again because though the Japanese had had promised them independence, that independence was a fake independence and they noticed that. And then they changed sides and fought against um, the Japanese in the end. The roots of the, of the Tatmadaw or its, its founding founding comrades lie in, this, in the, what is called the Dobama Asiayon, which was a nationalist Bama um, organization uh, during British rule from the 1930s. So, uh, Bama, Bama are the largest group in the country. They make up about 60% of the country, whereas the other ethnic groups are much smaller, but together these, these other ethnic groups make up about 40% of the country in terms of population. And the Bama are centered, so to say, in, this, in the central part of, of the country, whereas the other ethnic groups are sort of um, on the on a horseshoe of, of mountains that surround the, the central flatlands. And the nationalism that is formed under in, in the 30s um, is important to understand um, because it still influences and is the main ideology of the military. And it's it is a it is a nationalism that is centered on this largest ethnic group. Uh, so it's a Bama nationalism and not say an all Burma nationalism. It's highly chauvinistic and, and racist in a sense. And um, it is one of its main features is a is a is a is a fear and, and hatred of everything from outside because uh, they experienced um, British rule as a humiliation of their own culture with just to mention some small parts of that, um, British soldiers trampling, not taking off their shoes um, in, in pagodas, for example, which is a very big um, cultural and, and religious offense for the local people. They destroyed pagodas partly um, the destruction of the of the last Burmese kingdoms was also humiliation. So this is how this Burma nationalism developed, and this is what um, what the Tatmadaw is still uh, sort of is their main ideology, and especially Ni Win, who has formed um, and influenced the Tatmadaw most of, of over the last decades, was a very nationalistic and racist person. So after he had taken over of the uh, official armed forces uh, after World War II, um, he Burmanizes these armed forces because at first you have different ethnic groups in the armed forces. But when he takes over, especially the upper ranks are only filled by Bama. You will find very, very few people of other ethnic groups in the higher ranks of the, of the army. He is strictly opposed to federalism, which is why the, the civil war has been going on basically since World War II. Um, they have a very negative view of parliamentary democracy, which is shaped by these first 10 years uh, of the 1950s, where they were in their perception, uh, the country was in total chaos. And so they think that, the, that parliamentary democracy is not really able to hold the country together. And they have this self image of being the mother and father of the nation. They are extremely brutal when it comes to especially counterinsurgency operations. They apply the so-called four-cut strategy, which, to put it very shortly, is an all-out attack on, an, on also the civilians of an ethnic group when they are fighting their respective um, ethnic re rebels. Um, but they are also merciless against their own political opponents, like the NLD. So many of the current leaders of the NLD have spent a lot of time in jail, have been tortured, um, still have uh, health problems because of the way they've been treated in, in jail if they have survived it at all. Um, one important notion, especially in the context here when we talk about diplomacy is that we need to understand that their biggest motivation are internal factors. Um, 
it's not so much, they don't care much about what will the US do if we do this? What will China say when we do that? Their main motivation is in the country. How do they have gained power? How do they keep control of the country? Um, they of course have to think to a certain extent to internet about international reactions, but this is not the main motivating factor. Um, and they are also formed, as I said, by a crude perception of reality. They think they are the mother and father of the nation. They think that people love them, um, despite the many, many times that the people have showed them that the opposite is true. And the main aim is, again, to keep power, to build the state according to their own, what I would say is a racist nationalist ideology. And it is in this light also that we have to understand the current constitution, which came into force in 2010, but was uh, adopted in 2008. Um, it was essentially drafted by the Tatmadaw. They, there was a constitutional convention where they claimed that six, six, seven hundred people have taken part, which is officially true, but none of these people were really elected. None of those had proper influence on what was, um, what, uh, how the constitution was drafted. Uh, a former minister of, uh, of the country, um, a former general also told me that it was essentially three people who, three lawyers who drafted the constitution according to Dantre's, the former dictator Dantre's wish, wishes. And it was also sort of a retirement plan for Dantre and, and the military that they can go sort of relinquish some of the power to allow more money to come in as well, um, but to still keep in power enough. So in 2008, um, this, uh, this constitution was uh, adopted by referendum, although that referendum was obviously not free and fair. And also it was a few days after Cyclone Nargis struck the country, which completely devastated um, the lower part of the country and left over 140,000 people dead, um, which, was, which could have been much reduced had the military government not been so incompetent and paranoid about foreign aid that they didn't let into the country. But the constitution does relinquish some power to a civilian government while keeping a powerful place for the Tatmadaw to, as they call it, take part in national politics. Um, and some of the main features of that are that they basically are guaranteed 25% of all seats in the different parliaments. So there are two chambers of union parliament in both chambers, they have 25%. And then there are the regional or state parliaments where they also um, keep 25% of the seats. That means that when there is an election, the people only elect 75% of the seats available in parliament. The rest are handpicked by the commander in chief. And that in turn means that there is no way for constitutional reform to take place because you need more than 75% of the votes in parliament to change the constitution. So basically they have entrenched themselves um, in, in the system and the power is basically, there is not much that a civilian government can do about it. They also, uh, the command in chief also selects three of the most important ministries and one of the two vice presidents and they are not under any civilian control. There is no, uh, they have their own judges. They have no, there's no, no one above the command in chief when it comes to commanding um, the armed forces. So the civilian government as much power as they might have on general legislature, they can do nothing really to order the, the military to do what, what they would like to see. So in short, it's a very comfortable position for the Tamadon because they retain their power. It's basically impossible to change that fact. They retain the possibility to dominate the economy of the country and enrich themselves. They also can put part of the blame of the things that go wrong, they can put on the civilian government now and don't have to take responsibility for everything that happens in the country, which is also why everyone uh, or many people were very surprised about this coup, but I will come to that. But also important to understand is there are certain loopholes in the constitution, um, which are due to their own incompetence, I would say, and paired with a uh, weird perception of reality. The president is an extremely powerful person, even though he doesn't have oversight over the Tatmadaw, but um, the fact that, uh, and, and so it's a very powerful person and the, the military has underestimated the disdain the people have for them and that they would vote, vote actually vote for someone else um, who is in power now. Um, and um, yeah, so there are certain loopholes that have also been used by the NLB. 
And there was also um, never a plan that Aung San Suu Kyi would be part of this, that uh, as I have understood was more of an accident. So what led to the coup? Um, a brief overview, the last, so in 2010, after the um, election, uh, the constitution came into power, there were elections, which were again, not really free and fair, but there was a sort of transition to a nominally civilian government under former general Dane Singh. And that he was leading a party, the Union Solidarity and Development Party, USDP, who consisted of former generals and was is basically was and is a proxy party of the military. Um, and people were skeptical, but um, they actually initiated strong reforms. And for the first time in many, many decades of isolation, we see an opening of the country in many senses, economic terms. Um, there was a certain normalization in international relations. There was a certain press freedom, although there was much left. Um, they could have been much better still, but it, it was an improvement um, that, that has to be admitted for sure. And so in 2012, the NLD decides, okay, we do play along um, this constitution now, we try it out. Um, there were by-elections, they win almost all of the seats, Aung San Suu Kyi, after having been in house arrest for over 10 years, um, gets, uh, was, was released after the elections in 2010 and wins a seat in 2012. And in 2015, in the general elections, the NLD wins a landslide victory and the USDP, uh, the proxy party of the military was completely sidelined and unimportant. So the NLD didn't even need any partners to form a government. And even though only 75% of seats in the parliament are elected, they had an absolute majority. This is repeated in 2020 and the NLD wins an even bigger landslide in, in those elections. Um, and then um, the, the first the USDP uh, cries that there um, that there was election fraud and people first laugh at them and they have laughed at them since then basically people laugh at them a lot in general um, and first the Tatmadaw did not pick that up but then they actually do and and foster this narrative of election fraud and start a, so an investigation um, but the unit election commission and the NLD refused to give in to the demands of the Tatmadaw and the USDP um, and they were constitutional Constitutionally, they were right to do so, but that certainly has angered um, the leadership of the military. Um, and again, now, um, when I come to the motivations of uh, the potential motivations of the of the military, I want to reiterate: this is a lot of speculation, and very hard, very hard to tell. Tell, I would think that um, while the Tatmadaw has a very comfortable position and it seems very comfortable from the outside they probably had a bit of a different plan on how all of this would turn out when they introduced the, uh, the, um, the constitution. Because I would think that given that they have 25% of the seats guaranteed to them, they would have expected that they make at least another 25% through their proxy party and could continue to form government or put generals who retire from military into the civilian government. And um, that has obviously not materialized because they did not again recognize how disliked they are in their own population. Um, and maybe they accepted that in 2015 and then they thought, okay, they will see that the NLD cannot properly lead a government and we will win again in 2020. Again, this did not materialize. And despite being quite safe, we can, I, I would assume that to a certain extent, the Tatmada saw its own position threatened because they have so little support from the people and the population. Um, and then there is a personal factor that uh, Senior General Minang Lang, seen here at the top, um, is supposed to retire this summer because he turns 65 this year and his term had already been extended from 60 to 65. And what would have happened then is that it would have been the president who would have picked the next commander in chief. Um, and that would have been the first time that a civilian would have picked up, picked the commander in chief. Um, he would have to select them from the armed forces, but still he could have elect, selected someone who would be more willing to cooperate. And, and I guess that saw the, the Tatmadaw and especially Minang Lang sort of threatened. And many people also speculate that Minang Lang just wanted uh, another position and he didn't want to relinquish power. Um, he is filthy rich. His family has made a lot of money um, over the past 
decades. Um, so this is not about money in that sense. Um, this is probably only about power. Um, and so those are sort of the, 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 the factors behind the thinking. And then I think um, probably the standoff between the military and the NLD escalated about this voter fraud because um, the NLD just simply refused to take any of that seriously. And it was a double humiliation of the Patmado that they lost or their proxy party lost another election by a landslide even worse than before. And um, their power was sort of ignored because they just, no one took their, their demands seriously. And I guess this humiliation was simply too much for, um, for people that are used to, or expect that they are accepted as rulers and see it as their right to be ruling the country. Um, so this is, I think, basically the, 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 the basic assumptions about what led to the coup right now, I would guess. But again, we might learn more as, as time passes. Um, an important part of this now is to say that the, state of the declaration of state of emergency was illegal, even by the 2008 constitution. But the patent law this time, unlike in the previous coups, are not abolishing the constitution but they are saying that we keep the constitution in place and we are acting constitutionally. A bit of detail here. The state of emergency can only be declared by the president. Now, what they did was to get that out of the way, they arrested President Uwingin for allegedly having, um, and this is no joke, broken COVID-19 restrictions last summer. Um, and um, of course, Uwin Min, as the president, is, is immune from, from being, from being persecuted, uh, prosecuted like that. Um, um, but that, in that way, they said he cannot fulfill his duties, so the vice president is acting president, and he declared a state of emergency. That is, of course, totally unconstitutional. Um, the president was not disabled from, from fulfilling his office, so the vice president had no right at all to, um, to declare a state of emergency. And that in turn, um, and that in turn, I think, means that everything they do now should be seen as unconstitutional. But I will get to that part a bit later too. Um, the reactions in the country, um, to understand why, why the streets did not immediately fill up with people is that the memories of 1988 and 2007 are still very vivid in the population. So they are very careful. In 1988, basically, um, soldiers fired with machine guns into uh, huge protests in central Yangon and, and killing thousands of people over the course of those protests. Um, and no one wants to see a repeat of that. And similarly in 2007, when uprisings were uh, arised um, with, under the leadership of monks, the generals who call themselves Buddhists actually ordered to, um, their soldiers to fire at even at monks. And so, so the people are very aware of what the, the generals are capable of doing and that they would also use any escalation on the streets as a pretext for their retaining power. So people expected if they go on the street right away that thugs sent by the military would come to join them and then start riots and that escalation would have been used to justify uh, military rule further. But um, that doesn't mean that there was no uh, that there were no reactions at all, even in the beginning. So quickly, um, what started uh, has become a, a daily tradition, which um, um, is going on right now, I think, again, um, if I consider the time difference, I'm not quite sure. Every day at 8 p.m. in Myanmar, um, people go to the windows, go to the streets, as, uh, as you see on the picture here, and, and start banging pots like hell. And these protests, this, this pot banging has, it's not only in Yangon, it's, it's across, you can see it um, across all the country and it has been growing in intensity. So if you look at videos coming from the country, you hear whole cities uh, sounding of these, this pot banging, which also has a spiritual connotation because it's used uh, traditionally to drive out um, the devil or demons uh, once a year, which in turn, again, um, the generals are also very superstitious. So not only does it show the discontent of the people, but it also freaks them out a bit in a sort of psychological way, um, some people say. 
At the same time, we see a civil disobedience movement across um, many, many government agencies. I think the first ones were doctors and nurses who have very, very high, highly regarded positions in the country um, that refuse to accept um, the superiors of the new government and, and disobey work. Um, and that has been joined by many, many ministries and government agencies. And in the last days, we have also seen the beginning of massive protests on the streets. And we are talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people um, on the streets of, again, all parts of the country, even in remote areas, you see this. And, um, and the first day of these protests, it was largely, it remained largely peaceful or the, the police showed restraint. But um, as of today, um, and these days will be very decisive for that. Um, first shots, um, apparently life rounds have already been fired. A woman, a 19 year old woman is in critical condition. Um, I hope uh, she will survive. Um, I think it's a thing of minute to minute. But on the positive note, we also have seen some police that have defected and have been siding, have, have changed sides and, and have joined protesters who have from the very beginning have been trying to achieve this by giving water and snacks to the police and chanting P2E, uh, which means the people's police and similar things like that um, to make them join, join their protests. Um, the, some members elect of parliament um, have, for, have taken an oath because they were um, in late January and, and the 1st of February, most members elect of parliament were in a certain guest house in the uh, capital of Nepido, where they um, were, were quarantining before the start of the session. And they simply took their oath of office in there once they were, they, they basically were kept in there, those who were not arrested directly, the others were put in under arrest more or less in that hotel. But they um, made an oath of office there and now some of them have formed the representative council of the Pidang Suluta. The Pidang Suluta is the, is the, uh, is, are the two chambers combined. So it's the union parliament, both of them combined. And they, um, they have released some statements and required the international community not to recognize uh, the state administrative council, say it's legitimate and they are the only legitimate representatives alongside president Uwen Yin. The military has tried a divide and rule strategy as they have always done. They have tried to appease some of the other ethnic groups in the country by trying to, to, to add some of their politicians into their, into their council. And unfortunately, some of them have accepted, but it is very much to the anger of their own people who have become very furious at those people and those parties who have not shown total opposition to the new military junta. So what could happen next? Um, these are again speculations and this is a day-to-day -day basis and but I think the worst case that we could see is again a bloody suppression of protests as we have seen in 88 and 2007 um, and that one picture is is signaling that where uh, uh, I think this is in Napido today or yesterday um, with a police officer aiming at at protesters with probably live ammunition. <clears throat> we could also see an escalation of civil war if things go really bad. So far, there are about uh, 20, more than 20 um, armed groups in the country, which are more or less active, many of them smaller, some of them larger. But um, in the worst case, if everything escalates, we can see an escalation of the civil war, which has never stopped, um, by the way. And we see already, um, we have already seen in past weeks an escalation in the southeast against the Karen and 5,000 people being displaced there. Whereas we have over, I think, I don't know the number right now in Rakhine in the west, uh, 100,000 people, if not 200,000. We still have the Rohingya in, in Bangladesh, um, almost a million people sitting in the mud. Um, and we have over 100,000 internally displaced people in Kachin and northern Shan states. So this is still very much going on, could escalate. Um, we could see uh, an extreme economic crisis. They have already been hit very hard by, um, by the economic crisis in the wake of COVID-19, especially the poor people, the day-to-day -day laborers. I think um, numbers of extreme poverty have jumped from 16% to, from to over 50. I would have to look it up now, but um, that has become very, very problematic and can, can just become worse um, uh, in the wake of this military coup. And of course, we could be most likely to see an, the pandemic at a bit out of control, which has been contained 
fairly well so far. Um, the vaccine pro, um, vaccination efforts have just started. Um, but now with all these large gatherings and no proper control, no government agencies working, who knows what, what will happen in that. <clears throat> in the best case, um, and this is more represented also by the second picture, um, we all hope that this is the final struggle against the military generals and that this is the last time people are extremely determined, <clears throat> are extremely motivated and don't want this to happen again. They don't want to go back, especially now that they have had a taste, so to say, of, of, of openness, of, of some freedom in the past five to 10 years. Um, there's a new generation um, out now that are very connected. The internet has come to the country and while the military junta have turned it off for, I think, a day or two in the past week, um, we very much hope that they cannot uphold that for too long because even their economy is now based to an extent on, on the internet. But for that to succeed, what is needed is, of course, that, that um, we see at least parts of the military and police forces switch sides or at least disobey orders to shoot at people, I would say. Um, and so it is, I think, of crucial importance that first defections are seen and um, that police, there are, there are very good pictures today where you see while the police was shooting water cannons and people that three or four policemen out of the crowd came into the protest and started shielding them and stuff like that. So these are very positive signs um, and we would hope that um, the military would follow in at least in, in part. Then there's the question whether the elections will actually be held as the military says. So some people might ask, well, let's just have the state of emergency for a year and, and see and then go back to elections and to the way it was before. But I think that is very unlikely to, to succeed because um, I, I cannot imagine that the, the people will accept this. And because um, there was very little trust in the army and in the constitution. Um, and I think that trust has been absolutely destroyed that now because people have always warned that whenever they want, they can and will take power and they have proved to do that now. So I cannot imagine that the people will, will um, accept a return to that system as before or whatever changes the military is going to make now within this year uh, in, the, in the constitution. It's also unlikely that the NLD will accept this um, because I cannot imagine that the military will allow Aung San Suu Kyi to take part in these elections and then it will be simply unacceptable to the NLD and to the vast majority of the population. Um, and again, I think in, in uh, external action is of, of little importance, unfortunately. There is not much that can be done from outside. I will come to what we actually can do, but um, it is the developments within the country that are decisive. So it's, it's in the hands of, of the people now. The little we can do from outside and that goes to individuals, um, look for solidarity protests near you and online. Um, this actually matters to people in the country. Um, it's not about, and while it, it might seem that it's, it's not necessary, um, a the country has been isolated for so many decades that they really, um, they, they really, and it gives them strength when they see that people outside are showing solidarity and care about, about Myanmar and care about what is happening to the population. Um, so don't think this is just like, oh, who cares whether we, we protest or not. It, it, it is moral support that I think is important for the people in the country. And if you look at the reactions that videos from outside, from protests outside get in the country, that's the, they are very, very positive. You can also look for some donations. There are actually is some, some things that you can help with. There are more and more fundraising opportunities popping up to support, for example, the families of those taking part in the civil disobedience movement. Um, there are people who help topping up um, uh, phone credit and internet credit for people. So there are like small things that can be done from outside. Keep <clears throat> following what's going on and especially to journalists, keep it in the news from time to time. This is certainly not over within a week. And you can also support journalism. And I've, I've, I've put two websites here that are very, very good um, outlets, um, both English and in Burmese, uh, Frontier Myanmar Net and, and Myanmar Now. There are others as well, but those are like the, I think, two that are very worthy to, to support so they can keep the information flow. If we look at international actors, um, I think the general question is in, in the reaction that should guide uh, international reactions, what do we think is most likely to lead to positive change? And 
Um, of course, there are gray zones. I will just outline two two ways. Um, will it be immediate protests that actually manage to force the generals to step down again in combination with parts of the, the military um, and the police siding with the with the people on the ground? <coughs> um, and is it does uh, of utmost importance that we focus on only supporting them? Or do we think it will be a longer way and, and we need to leave a way for the generals to just to, to step down or relinquish power and, and save face at the same time? Um, this is where I cannot give an, a definitive answer to that. Um, I sure hope that it's the first one, but um, again, I, I don't feel that I understand the military enough and um, that I could say exactly what is going, what is going to, to bring change. But I think for now, um, for what we can do, what should be done for sure is that uh, outside actors do not recognize the legitimacy of the state administrative council. And for that, we can use their own constitution as an argument. And I think that's important when you talk to the generals, um, if you mention the human, the universal declaration of human rights in these documents, they don't care about that, obviously. They don't care about human rights. Um, now, this should be mentioned, of course, in, in, in statements and so on, but also mention the, the 2008 constitution because it is what the generals um, allege that they are keeping, but they have obviously broken it. And there is an argument for them that they are illegitimate even under their own constitution. And that also means that we still recognize who we mean as president because he is president as long as a new one is elected, even under a state of emergency. Um, but that's why don't call it state of emergency. It's a coup d'etat. It's illegal and illegitimate. It's also worth, I think, considering to recognize the representative council of the Pidang Luto that I mentioned before um, to support them because they have declared, as I said, that they are the sole representative of the people and the government is legitimate. Um, and we should avoid uh, general economic sanctions. They have never worked against the generals. They hurt the population and they will not lead to change. They may just make things worse, but it is important to do targeted sanctions and maybe have a look. Um, I mean, an Austrian company has sold uh, drones without weapons, but still drones that ended up with the military. This cannot happen. We like this is it's it's incredible that this was possible, and the EU and EU member states really have to make sure that this nonsense does not happen anymore. Um, they cannot sell anything to to the military. Um, I would also say speak to China and Russia. China is not behind this. China is not happy about this. China does not like the generals. They are unreliable. Um, you can see that the, the statement while it, of the Security Council could have been strong worded, they did side with it. They did call for the release of people. They didn't call it a coup d'etat, okay, but they called for the release of these other politicians. This is much more than, much more significant than I think than we think. Um, China will, of course, not take a strong stance against the new. They will deal with whichever regime is in place, but they really tried to get a good relationship with Aung San Suu Kyi. Don't forget, it was a military general, that a former military general who stopped the largest Chinese project in the country, uh, the dam uh, mid-zone, the huge um, dam project that was supposed to be built and suspended in 2009 or 2011, sorry, 2011. Um, so this is not impossible. Um, and we should also be careful where the money goes. A lot of uh, development cooperation has been set aside for Myanmar, which is a good thing in general, but we should really be careful what we support and that this does not, especially budgetary support, as has been done for, um, for education reform, um, is, should be out of question right now, as long as this illegitimate government is in place. Um, that's from me now, but I'm now happy to take questions, comments, and, and have some discussion as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Bauer, for this really interesting and informative talk about these recent horrific happenings. Um, I would like to give you some questions from the audience now. For example, here we have um, Mr. Peter Moser, who is asking, is there any information available on who are the main suppliers of weapons to the Tat Mara? Um, I think this is mainly China and Russia at the moment, but um, we've seen weapons coming from India as well, because they want to counter China's influence in the region. Obviously, I think the, the Indians have donated a submarine, for example. So, of course, what would be very useful on an international level would be to get a complete weapons embargo. Um, 
through the UN Security Council. Now, I don't know if the Chinese and Russians would go that far, um, but they are, I think, yeah, so, so China, Russia, and, and some, some other states, Israel has at times the, delivered weapons, but um, we should also check how, yeah, that not, that not even dual use, um, not direct weaponry, um, but dual use things like drones and, and planes from, from Europe uh, reach to Tamado. Um, another question from Mr. Moser. Um, how could the coup d'etat possibly affect the, um, the Tatmada conflict with the various regional political and also partly armed powers like the Shan state or the Arakan? Could you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, so as I said, yeah, so as I said, um, we have over 20 regional armed groups. Um, the most important um, this, the biggest one of those has almost, I think, 30,000 soldiers and control their de facto independent state. There's other Hua in, in Northern Shan State on the border to China. Um, uh, this is very difficult to say uh, at the moment. They have been holding back um, some of the important groups uh, that are currently in the so-called nationwide ceasefire agreement, which is neither nationwide nor a real ceasefire, um, have condemned the coup and, and called for release. Um, others who are more actively fighting, like the American Army and the Kachin Independence Army, there has been uh, a stop of fighting in the last recent months, but, but it was very intensive over the last years, um, have not said anything yet. Um, so, so far, there's an escalation. I think the Tamado is trying again its divide and rule strategy and try to get them on their side, um, whether that will work or not. Um, I do not dare to make exact predictions on that. Thank you. Um, something I think that is quite interesting is what do you think is the position of the Buddhist clergy regarding to the coup d'etat? Mm. Um, that's a good question. I forgot to mention in the um, in my in our presentation. Um, I think uh, it's, it, it is very important, obviously, because um, Buddhist monks are extremely uh, influential in the country. Um, so. The military has already gone to their main monk, the so-called the Sitagu Sayadaw, who has also given them support, for example, in 2017, when they massacred the Rohingya in the west of the country, um, and has basically said, well, they are not Buddhists, so you can, this is shortening it very much, but they are not Buddhists, so it's fine, you didn't kill any real human beings, and he has given them his blessing again. On the other hand, there are um, many monks that are very pro-democracy and have, as those who who, who rose in 2007. And so three of their leaders have already been arrested. So they will be very important. And we have already seen monks in the street as well. So we shall see um, how this plays out, which parts so the, the, the clergy is huge. I think there are almost, the estimates are about 400,000 monks in the country. Um, and uh, they, are, they are not all on the same page, obviously, as we see. Um, so we will see how, where they will put their lots and where they will be more vocal. But the Tamado is also seen as opening pagodas, cleaning pagodas, donating. Them. They're going exactly back to what they did before the, before the takeover, where they try to, um, to, to speak sort of to the, to the religious sentiments, which are extreme, extremely important in the country. And, and yeah, they have opened pagodas again, for example, for people to visit. Thank you. Um, what do you think is happening to Don Aung San Suu Kyi, because the last time she was put under house arrest, do you think this is going to happen again, or, or could it be even more dramatic? Yeah, that, um, that's, that's also a decisive question, I think. Um, so she has now been charged with, and again, I'm not joking, um, illegal possession of walkie-talkies, um, which um, may, may sound ridiculous, and of course uh, is ridiculous, but I think what they will, what they might try to do is to get this um, trial through quickly. Um, she has not seen a lawyer, by the way. She's held incommunicado, more or less. Um, she and and if she is convicted under this law, as ridiculous as it is, I think that might prevent her from holding certain office um, in the future. So this might be one way to for them to get rid of her. Um, I, I cannot imagine that the the military plans a return to some sort of um, some sort of elections that include her as an option for the people to vote for, because they've seen they cannot win against her. Um, I would not think that they would dare to kill her or disappear her 
or have her have an accident. Because if that happens, um, I don't think that people will hold back much anymore, and we would say uh, see an extreme escalation. So that will also be a crucial development in the next in the next weeks. Um, Mr. Guiton Castillon is asking: um, Does the UK, as the former colonial power, still play a si significant political or economic economic role in in Myanmar? My, from my experience with the, with the diplomats, I, I do think they are much better informed about the country than many other parts uh, of Europe. Um, also because they have uh, good universities and scholars that, that, deal with, that deal with the country. Um, but they certainly don't have more influence. And I mean, the Tatmadaw certainly doesn't really like them. Um, they see, yeah, it, they were foreign rulers and they were not justified rulers according to the military. And of course, they were not justified rulers, legitimate rulers of the country. Um, but um, they don't have significant influence, I would say. I mean, they have, they, they are good, they have good connections in the country, I guess, and they are good, they have a good foreign service. But um, other than that, I don't think that they have especially large influence. May I, may, may I step in with an additional question that has also to do with the United Kingdom. Do you know why independence in 1948 took place? They did not join the Commonwealth of Nations, but it, it, as India did. Yeah, um, that, that was a question, but um, that was, I think, um, some may have wanted that, but I think the, the political situation did not really allow for that because uh, uh, Aung San, who was the, the leader of the, of the Burmese independence movement at the time, had to sort of appease the different parts of the, of the movement. And especially the communists, if, if they had said they will stay within the Commonwealth, the, the communists would have called them traitors um, and would not have accepted it. They didn't accept it in uh, any way. But I think um, by the time they decided that also the main, the strongest voices within the independence movement were simply to complete independence. They, they just wanted to get rid of the British and be a completely independent country. So that question was quite obviously answered with, no, we will not stay in the Commonwealth. So one last question um, from Michael Saxel. Uh, will the coup d'etat affect the relations with India? Oof. Um. <laughs> Uh, it's a good good question. I can I I'm I know way too little about India and, and the, the relationship with them. Um, I would assume that the Indians will try to work with a with a military government as well because my assumption is that the Indians also one of the main targets is to contain China's power and and have uh, enlarge their own influence uh, and strengthen their own influence. So I cannot. I guess I mean also the the Indian government is not very democratic anymore is it time but uh, there are others who know much much better about that um but i would it, how it will influence them I, I don't know yet but i don't think that they will take a hard stance against any new regime just to um contain china a bit but uh, other people know much better about this than me. thank you i guess we are um currently at the end of all questions that arose um Mr. Bauer, thank you for your very interesting talk. Um, it was highly informative about the latest happenings in Myanmar. Um, thank you. And thank you very much for having me. And I hope people will stay tuned and have a look at what is going on in there. And don't forget the 50, more than 50 million people that now face uh, guns against their heads again um, and see what we can do from the outside, the little we can do to help them. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. We certainly will stay committed. To the Thank you very much.